Hi, everybody, and welcome to the last presentation of Virtual Bird Bash. Right now, we're going to um, hear a presentation by Kay and Robert Lookingville about um, their experience banding uh, raptors. And if you have any questions for Kay, you can go ahead and drop those in the comments, and we will try to get to those at the end. Enjoy. Welcome to our presentation on raptor banding. We are the Looking Bills, Robert and Kay Looking Bill, and we are federally permitted licensed bird banders. First off, a little bit of background about bird banding. It is controlled under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and the program is administered by the Bird Banding Laboratory headquartered at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center in Laurel, Maryland, and is part of the U.S. Geological Survey. Bird banding requires both federal and state banding permits. The bird banding lab issues the federal permits for the entire country, and different states have various requirements for obtaining state banding permits. Robert and I both hold a federal permit and a state banding permit for the state of Texas. Permits are issued to qualified applicants who have a valid specific scientific research goal. What is bird banding? In a nutshell, we capture wild birds by a variety of methods. We attach an aluminum leg band to each bird. Each leg band has a unique number on it, which allows us to identify individual birds. We record some data and then we release the birds unharmed. All of this takes just a matter of minutes. Here are some of the tools we use while we're raptor banding. We use different measuring devices, including rulers, tape measures, and calipers. We use a leg gauge, which I'll explain a little bit more in a bit. We have various size boxes and cans, which again, I'll show you next. And of course, different pliers and different size bands to fit different size birds' legs. On raptors, we use what are called lock-on leg bands. There is a tab that folds over to secure the band in place. This is required because the bills on raptors are strong enough to crush, distort, or even remove a regular butt-ended band that we normally use on other birds. The aluminum bands are lightweight, so it does not affect the bird's ability to fly or hunt or do any other things that a bird normally does in life. In addition to the unique number, there is a website or a 1-800 number on the band so that any subsequent encounters can be reported. When we do catch a raptor, we gently fold their wings and slide them into an appropriate size can. I call them Goldilocks size boxes or cans. In other words, not too tight that it might restrict their breathing and yet not so loose that they have room to thrash around and potentially hurt themselves. There are air holes in the ends of the can so they can breathe but it's dark, which helps keep them calm and safe. Raptors are visual creatures, so if they can't see what's going on, they tend to stay calm, which also keeps us safe for the brief period of time that we hold them. Once in the can, then we use a leg gauge to determine the proper size band to put on the bird. The leg gauge has different slots in it, and each slot size corresponds to a different band size. We want the band to be loose enough where it slides up and down the leg, similar to a bangle bracelet on a wrist, but not so loose that it might slip up over the joint or down off over the foot. And then we actually attach the leg band to the bird, being very mindful of their talons. Talons are the weapon of choice for raptors. This is what they hunt with. This is a red tail hawk foot here, and you can see how long the talons are and how big the foot is. If this gra grabs a hold of your arm, it could cause serious injury, so we are always mindful of controlling the talons. Once the band is on the bird, we take various measurements, including weight. We place the bird in the box briefly on a scale long enough to obtain the weight. Other measurements we take on the birds include measuring the length of the tail. We also measure the wing cord. This is the distance from the wrist joint to the tip of the longest flight feather without flattening the natural curve of the wing. We also
also measure the hallux. Raptors have four talons, three in the front and one in the back. The one in the back is called the hallux. It is the longest and strongest one. And finally, we measure the culmen, which is the top part of the build. We measure from the edge of the sear, which is the fleshy part of the build closest to the face, to the tip of the build. In the raptor world, eye color changes with age. In the case of Buteos, the young birds have paler color eyes than the adults. And as an example, this is a red tailed hawk. When the red tailed hawks fledge, they have almost lemon yellow eyes, and it slowly turns to a dark chocolate brown after about two years. Raptors have a second eyelid called a nictitating membrane, similar to what a shark has. This protects the eye from foliage when they're flying through understory or brush. Also protects their eye, eyes from wind and dust, and of course from flailing prey. So you see the head? You watch this how the uh, head stays perfectly still, even though Robert's moving the body around. That's a very important adaptation for for this bird and for other raptors in general. They can keep their heads still and focus on their prey, so it helps them become successful hunters. Raptors also have interesting adaptations on their tongue. See that hole at the base of the tongue? That's the opening to the trachea, which is the air pipe that leads directly to the lungs. They can close that off when they're eating. If you've ever heard a rehabber say, don't feed or try to feed an injured bird, this is the reason why, because it's way too easy to get food or liquid into their lungs. There are also some arrow-shaped projections on the tongue which help to position and guide food for them to swallow. For the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to focus on three species that are most common in our study area along the upper Gulf Coast of Texas. They are red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawk, and American kestrel. We'll start with red-tailed hawks. Let's look at red-tailed hawks comparing adults to juveniles. From the front, they look very similar. They both have a pale underwing with a dark leading edge called a patagial mark. In flight, this becomes almost black and white and it becomes very apparent. It looks like a, a light colored bird with a dark colored marking along the leading edge of the wing. They both also have comma shaped markings at the edges of their underwing coverts. And they both have belly bands. Belly band varies a lot from one individual to another. Sometimes there's almost none, as in the adults on the right, and sometimes they're very heavily marked, and oftentimes they're more like the, the juvenile on the left. It's a kind of intermediate marking. And of course, as we talked about before, the eye color is different. But the pale color of the juvenile versus the dark color of the adult. From the back side, Red tail hawks look very different between the juvenile and the adult. The juvenile is mostly uniformly brown with a brownish tail, and the adult, of course, has that uh, richer brown color with a, a very obviously rufousy colored tail. The other difference is the primaries. The primaries are the flight feathers on the outer half of the wing. There are 10 of them. On the juveniles, the primaries are pale compared to the inner flight feathers, which are called the secondaries, which are darker. And on the adults, they're usually uniformly colored uh, a dark brown all the way out the length of their wing. This is very obvious in flight, especially if they're backlit. The juveniles appear to have a pale color window panel on the outer half of their wing. Red tail hawks have several different subspecies. And there is actually some disagreement on how many subspecies there are. So for simplicity's sake, I'm going to focus on the handful that are most common in our study area in southeast Texas. The eastern and northern subspecies are generally pretty clean on the belly and underwing, uh, underwing coverts are relatively unmarked, whereas the western subspecies is much richer in color and darker in general. 
with more markings on the underside of the wings and the chest. Oftentimes, the Western also has that rich cinnamon color or buffy color wash to the underparts. These are all migratory subspecies, and they breed either in the north or west or eastern part of the U.S. and come to the Texas Gulf Coast for the winter time. But there's lots of variations between all of these subspecies. In some parts of Texas, there is another subspecies called the Fuertes race is a non-migratory subspecies. They breed locally and then they maintain territory in that same area all year round. They are generally a little bit bigger than some of the other subspecies and as you can see on this individual their belly band is nearly absent. Red tail hawk tail patterns vary by subspecies as well. The eastern, northern, and Fuertes subspecies all have a solid rufous colored tail with a dark subterminal band, whereas the western subspecies, in addition to that, has many narrow dark bands going up the length of the tail towards the body. All of these subspecies readily interbreed with each other, especially where their ranges overlap, and that results in tail patterns that are decidedly in between two typical patterns that I previously showed you as shown in these two birds here. One more subspecies worth mentioning is the Harlan's hawk. There is some discussion whether this should actually be a separate species altogether, but currently it is a subspecies of the red-tailed hawk. There are both light morph and dark morph versions of the Harlan's hawk. This is a light morph. They're generally more black and white than the typical red tail, lacking much of that rufous color, buffy color wash to the undersides. They are generally much darker, and they have a very wide band on the trailing edge of their wings. The tail patterns on Harlan's hawks are highly variable. In fact, they're probably unique from one individual to another, similar to our fingerprints. The color ranges from almost white to red, grays, browns, various in-betweens, and various combinations of all of the above. It ranges from banding on the tail of feathers individually to more of a muckledy look, and yes, that's an official scientific term. Patterns can vary from one feather to another within the same tail. As you can see on the bottom right, some of the tail feathers are striped and others are mottled. Sometimes even on the same feather, as on the same bird on the bottom right, you can see some of the tail feathers are half red and half brown with bands on them. So now I want to talk about molt a little bit. Feathers on a bird provide all the same functions that clothing does for us. It keeps them warm in cold weather. It protects the skin from the sun. It provides camouflage. It attracts a mate. Um, all these things that are close do for us, the feathers do for the bird. But they wear their feathers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long. They're outside in the hot and the cold, in the sun, in the rain, the snow, the wind. And after time, just like our, our clothes do, the feathers fade, they fray, they break, they just wear out. So once a year, they molt their feathers to keep them in tip top shape to, so they can maintain the ability to fly and do all those other things that we've just talked about. Now, it takes a lot of energy to molt. It also takes a lot of energy to breed, and it takes a lot of energy to migrate, so they generally don't do any two of those things at the same time. They generally molt in late summer after they're done breeding, but before they start migrating. Molt is pretty complex, so to simplify it, I'm just gonna focus on the outer half of the wing on the flight feathers called primaries, which are P1 through 10. Red tail hawks often don't replace all of their primaries in a single molt cycle. On this bird, you can see that P9 and P10 are different than P1 through 8. This bird has replaced the, the feathers P1 through P8 into new adult plumage feathers, whereas P9 and 10 are retained older feathers see they're more narrow, they're browner, they're more frayed, they're more pointed, 
These are juvenile feathers that the bird did not replace the first time it molted. Because it molted exactly once, we know how old it is. If this bird was banded, say, in January, that means it molted in the previous summer, which means it hatched the previous summer before that. So this bird would be about two years old. So this is a different red-tailed hawk, and you can see that the molt pattern on this one is quite different than that on the previous one. Starting from the outer primary, P10, you can see P10 looks older than P9, and P8 is also older. Seven, six, and five look newer. Four looks older, and then three, two, and one look newer. The older feathers are browner and more frayed, but you'll notice the P10 on this bird is not as narrow and pointed as the previous bird, so that is an adult feather. So by the way the molt pattern is and by how we know the molt sequence operates on birds, we can say for sure that this bird has molted at least three times, which means it's over three years old. He may be much older. The longevity record for red-tailed hog is around 30 years. So, but the best we can say is that this bird is at least four years old. Recaptures are both rare and special. This particular red-tailed hawk was found injured along the side of a road, apparently from a vehicle strike. It was gathered up and taken to a local rehabilitating facility where they fixed it up successfully and we banded it just prior to releasing it back into the wild. The rehabber released it at the same location it was found injured because they are very territorial. Fast forward about five years, we caught this same bird in exactly the same location. And we know it's the same bird because of the band number. Without the band number, we would have never known. There have been several occasions where we've recaptured our banded birds within yards of where we originally banded them. This illustrates a concept called site fidelity. Site fidelity can be defined as the tendency for an animal to return to a previously occupied location. Many species of migratory birds establish two territories, one in the summertime for their breeding season and the other during the wintertime during their non-breeding season. They often return to the same little patch of property on both ends of their migratory path. So why is this concept so important? It shows that a specific tract of land is important to an individual bird's survival. Birds displaced by development will go in search of other suitable habitat, which already has an established population inhabiting it. So there will be some competition going on for that habitat. The weaker individuals will be pushed to the margins and many will not survive. So this kind of data will help us to establish sound science-based conservation and land management policies and practices. Another type of encounter is when a bird we banded gets reported from somewhere else at a later date by somebody we don't know. This is an example of that. This is a juvenile red-tailed hawk that we banded near Surfside Beach, Texas, which is about 40 miles down the coast from Galveston in December of 2019. In September of 2020, it was reported from Eastern North Dakota. Unfortunately, it was found dead on the side of the road by a local resident. This person noticed the band and reported it to the banding lab. It's sad that the bird died, but it's nice to get the data point. Unfortunately, this is how most of these types of encounters are reported since red-tailed hawks don't come into contact with people that often. So most of our returns of this nature are from either mortalities or injuries. But without the band, we'd have never known the connection between North Dakota and Southeast Texas. This is the range map for red-tailed hawks. The purple is where red-tailed hawks can be found year round all through the breeding season as well as the non-breeding season. The red indicates that the breeding range expands farther north, well into Alaska and throughout much of Canada. You can see that red-tailed hawks can be found all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, from Alaska all the way 
into most of Mexico and even parts of Central America and the Caribbean islands. So here's the question then, the birds that we see in the wintertime on the upper Texas Gulf Coast, where are they migrating from? We get a hint of the answer to that question from the data from the previous types of encounters that I just talked about. We don't get very many encounters of this type, but we have gotten encounters reported from eastern North Dakota, as we just talked about. We've had re uh, reports of red-tailed hawks from eastern Colorado, central Kansas, central Oklahoma, and elsewhere in Texas. The limited data that we have indicates that the red-tailed hawks that are here during the wintertime along the upper Texas Gulf Coast come from the Great Plains states just north of us and they move pretty much straight south. Okay, let's move on to red-shouldered hawks. Juvenile and adult red-shouldered hawks look very different from each other. As you can see on the juvenile on the left, they have a pale colored chest marked with heavy dark streaks and generally brownish color overall with the pale eye color. The adult on the right is roof is colored on the undersides of the, the belly, the chest and the underwing coverts with pale barring through the chest and of course with the dark eye. The red-shouldered hawks, juvenile and adults, also look very different from the backside. You can see the juvenile on the left is pretty uniformly brown with some barring on the, on the tail and the wings. And the adult, on the other hand, is a pretty much black and white checkered pattern on the wings, black and white barring on the tail, and that rich rufous color on, on the leading edge of the wing. When the wing is folded, that looks like a shoulder, and that's where they get the name from. But that's really a, a rufous colored patch between the wrist joint and the shoulder. Molting in red shouldered hawks is very similar to that that I described for red tails, but they usually molt all of their flight feathers. They molt once a year, again, usually after the breeding season is done in mid to late summer. So this bird is actively molting from adult plumage to adult plumage, which means it's molted at least one time before. You can see the new primaries drawing there on the wing. They generally only molt a few feathers at a time so they can still have the ability to fly and all that other stuff. Sometimes when they're flying, you can see that gap in their wing and some people think that that's because they must have gotten a fight or something and that is not the case. It's just natural molt. This is a juvenile red-shouldered hawk. This juvenile red-shouldered hawk is molting for the first time from its juvenile plumage into adult plumage. You can see there are four new primaries that are growing in along with one secondary, the black and white feathers. You can also note the old secondaries that are adjacent to the black feathers, how much more worn and frayed they look compared to the adult feathers. This is the same bird showing the tail. You can see some new adult feathers growing in right there in the center of the tail. I mentioned how rare and special recaptures are. This is an example of a red-shouldered hawk that we recaptured. We banded this bird first in this area. At the time, it was an undeveloped wooded tract. And now, two years later, you can see that they're starting to develop it with the roads and the fences and the clearing and all that behind it. But we did catch it in exactly the same location where we banded it the first time. Uh, unfortunately, the new houses that are there now probably displaced this bird and is probably breeding somewhere else nearby in other suitable habitat. Here is a close-up of the band on that bird that we just recaptured. You can see how caked up it is with mud and other debris. The, the, the number was still readable, and that's how we knew it was the same bird. Okay, the final species that we're going to talk about is an American kestrel. 
This is North America's smallest falcon. This particular individual is a male, and we know it's a male because it has slate blue colored wings along with the rufous colored back and tail. And this is the female American kestrel. She looks very different than her mate. She is uniformly brown with dark barring on the tail. On the back side of the heads of kestrels, you'll notice it has some dark spots that look almost like eyes. And that little V shape in the middle looks like a beak. It almost looks like a face. It is thought that this is a predator deterrent to help prevent being snuck up from behind by a predator. American kestrels, along with other falcons, have what's called a tomial tooth. This tomial tooth is on the upper bill of the, of the falcons and is a special adaptation to help it become a successful hunter. Is on the upper bill of the after we are finished banding a bird, then we adaptation to our back into the wild. My sound. So why do we ban birds? It's so we can learn things that we never had the opportunity to learn about before, other from banding studies. Various banding studies over the years has taught us a lot about the different breeding and reproductive behaviors and patterns of many different species. Everything about migration has been learned through banding studies, both the routes and the timing, uh, how long it takes, the connectivity between northern groups and southern groups, where they go. All of that has been learned from banding studies. Dispersal and range, behavior and social structure, breeding success, all of those things have been further developed and learned about from banding studies over the years. We learn about lifespan and survival rate of different populations in different locations and different habitats. And of course, site fidelity to both the breeding and wintering grounds is very important. And we have acquired a lot of different banding data to confirm that. So why ban birds? In a word, data. Bird banding has increased our knowledge and understanding of birds their behavior, their needs, their habitats. This data helps assist in habitat management procedures and processes. It also supports sound conservation initiatives based on science. The more we know about birds, the better equipped we will be to help them survive. Thank you for joining us. This is Kay and Robert Looking Bill. Hope you enjoyed watching. All right, hi, Kay and Robert. Um, let me try to unmute you, or can you unmute yourselves? Hi, Kay and Robert. Okay. Um, let me try to unmute you. Oh, can you hear, looks can like you can hear the video in the background. Can you turn the yeah. video off? Let me try to unmute you. Oh, can you hear, looks like you can hear the video in the background. Can you turn the yeah. video off? Thanks. Okay. Um, so the first question is, can they bite very hard or do they bite at all? <laughs> uh, yes, they can. Um, but most of the time they're wanting to get you with their talons. Uh, when they bite, they can get a quick nab and sometimes they do hurt and they break the skin, but they don't hang on. But if they get with their talons, they grab you, hold of you and they just kind of ratchet up and, and, and they don't let go. So we're not we're we're concerned about the bill but we're much more concerned about the talons gotcha um and then letty wants to know if we find an injured hawk or falcon can we try to rehab it or does it have to be a certified rehabber you have to take it to a certified rehabber uh i think you watched a video yesterday from dana simone from gulf coast wildlife rescue she's the rehabber we work with most often and we banded many of her uh, re successfully rehabilitated uh, raptors, a lot of owls, a lot of red-tailed hawks, red-shouldered hawks, uh, great horned owls, barred owls. So if you find an injured bird on the side of the road, try to cover it with a towel or a jacket or something, a blanket. And uh, as soon as you can 
uh, safely do so, get it into a cardboard box and then contact Gulf Coast Wildlife uh, Refuge and they'll come and get it. Um, can you ban- Your question is against the law to, to capture that? Them. Sorry. Robert said, uh, in answer to the question, it, it's actually against the law for you to try to rehab it yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and dangerous too. And dangerous. Um, <laughs> can you ban vultures? We do not ban vultures. Uh, vultures take a special kind of tag. Uh, it's a it's a wing tag. Uh, we don't have uh, the permit to do that. We don't have a valid scientific project to do that. Um, the wing tags are needed because vultures, um, because of their diet, eating dead animals, they get a lot of bacteria and stuff on their legs. So when they when they poop. They're, it's very acidic and it's very acidic for a reason and that's to kill all those germs and bacteria and stuff that are on their legs. And the acidity of that would eat away of the, one of those aluminum bands, bands in no time. So aluminum bands are not effective on vultures. They are, they are a completely different method of, of marking them. Gotcha. Um, and then follow-up question from Letty. How do you become a certified rehabber? My daughter is into saving animals. Okay. Uh, we don't have a lot of expertise in that, but I would suggest you contact one of your local rehab centers and ask to volunteer. They always need people to help with caring for the animals that they have in, 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 their, you know, in their facilities or running to pick up animals or taking them to places to get released or those kind of things. So I would suggest to contact you know, the, a rehab center that's close to you. There are several across the state. I'm, I'm not sure where this person lives, but uh, uh, most of those facilities are eager and happy to have anybody to come over and help volunteer with, with what they've got going on. And then that would give you a better idea also on what's all involved and whether that's, you know, it's not all the glamor <laughs> of letting birds go. There's a lot of uh, hard work involved. So um, that's that would be my suggestion. Yeah, good suggestion. They are always looking for volunteers. Um, and then I think last question is, how did you get into raptor banding? That's a, a long story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we, we, we learned how to ban birds on hummingbirds and passerines first. And then we took a uh, basically a birding trip to Utah. And one of our leaders on that tour was a man named Denver Holt, who operates and runs the Owl Research Center near Missoula, Montana. And uh, we got to know him pretty good. And he learned that we were bird banders. And he said, why don't you come up to Montana and help me band rough-legged hawks during the winter time? And we said, well, we don't really know how to do that yet. <laughs> we said, no, it's, you know, we, I really want you to come. So meantime, we had met another uh, gentleman named uh, William S. Clark, Bill Clark, who is one of the leading authorities on raptors in the country, if not the leading authority. Um, and we got to know him and he kind of mentored us and taught us how to band raptors. So we actually did go to Montana for two, two winters in a row to, to try to catch and ban rough-legged hawks in, in Montana during January. And then he invited, Bill Clark also invited us to go to Cape May, New, New Jersey, where they've had a raptor banding project in operation every fall since the late 60s. And so we went there for four years to get further trained and, and learn how to do it as well. So we just kind of fell into it by accident, but it turned out good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're glad that you guys are doing raptor banding. That's one of the coolest things going on. <laughs> it is All a lot. Right. Of fun. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. Um. So I think that's it for the questions. Thank you guys so much for your presentation. Uh, it was really fun to watch. All right. Well, glad you enjoyed it, and thanks for having us. Doing a good job. Take care. Thanks. All, All right. right. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.